Paul, welcome. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you for. I should just point out quickly that I'm, I'm executive chairman of Pivotal, not I was the <laughs> Foundry Foundation. I haven't taken your job yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. You do a better job. Actually, you, you, uh, you know, I, I was reading an uh, old article in Wired magazine recently. You can you can still find it from 2011, talking about the creation of uh, of Cloud Foundry. Right, the the story we're going to kind of walk through today dynamically with the living history uh, will kind of give us a, a chance to to go back and see what actually happened. But if you read in the 2011 Wired article by Cade Metz, it talks about what's the vision for Cloud Foundry. It hasn't changed. We're just still executing on what you laid out uh, originally. So, so just going back into history, you, you, uh, you joined VMware as CEO during a pretty dynamic time. Growth was stunning, created an ad hoc standard that is still dominating data centers. Tell us a little bit what that was like. That was a huge transition, obviously. Uh, you learned about how markets grow uh, and how to provide value. Well, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to see a couple of the waves of the industry. You know, people forget that uh, I'm old enough to have actually started my career working on mainframes uh, back in the late 1970s. Uh, and while VMware was doing very well and, and, and still is doing very well, it was clear that the next generation of computing was starting to um, to emerge. Uh, before VMware, actually, I, I, I had uh, started a company, and we were the very first small startup company out of Seattle, and we were the very first users of, of Amazon Web Services, of EC2. Uh, I, I remember in the beta test phase, uh, they actually one day, by accident, created two instances of our app. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, that really had us scratching our heads for a whole day, trying to figure out what the hell was going on because it's like whack-a-mole. You know, if you bring it down, it just sprang up somewhere else, et cetera. That actually uh, sounds a lot like Cloud Foundry. <laughs> 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 the, now, now it's by design, though. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, so a, a group of us, and so they're, they're, people had already seen what was happening at Amazon, and uh, people had seen what was happening at Google with their big... At that time, they called it the Borg engine, which mm. was the big provisioning uh, system that they used to provision their apps internally. Uh, and it was clear that th there was really going to be a need for two things. Uh, one was a, a system that allowed uh, people to more easily develop and deploy and manage uh, applications uh, at scale and reliably. So there was need for those kind of services. And secondly, there was a group of us who who felt that we would like to see the cloud area evolve in a different way, if not go back to being like the bad old days of the mainframe, where if you know you wrote an app uh, for IBM uh, in the you know in the 1980s, you're probably still paying IBM for the privilege of running that application, if you haven't managed to shoot it in the head by now. But that, that is, in fact, true. Uh, and you know, so there there was the there is the potential that. Uh, the same thing could happen in the cloud era, that, that you could write an app for one of these clouds and uh, essentially be held captive to it. And if people choose to do that, that's fine. Uh, but we thought that that shouldn't of necessity be the case and that there was the opportunity to do for the cloud era what Linux had done for hardware in some sense, uh, of provide a not only a, a very highly functional abstraction layer set of services, uh, but do it in a way that uh, allowed people more choice uh, as it went through it. And in addition, you know, a lot of us had seen the good and the bad of the open source world. If yeah. uh, and there was, a, uh, I certainly had, and others had a strong feeling that uh, not only should we make, uh, was there the need for an open and open source layer for the cloud, but it should be done uh, on principles of governance that really accentuated the good parts uh, of. Uh, 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 of open source as opposed to the bad parts. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I think to, to your credit and to the others who've put a lot of effort into the Cloud Foundry Foundation, we have something that uh, obviously can be improved and, and that we should be learning all the time. But it does, I think, uh, provide a, an example of how to do open source right in, in some sense. Yeah, the, the things that we try to do are increase inclusion. We try to maintain a high velocity at the same time. And there's kind of a tension there. Yeah. And a lot of open source projects solve it by not 
not allowing new people into the core, mm -hmm. uh, not finding new ways to, to bring new thoughts in or, or you know, creating heresies around new thoughts. So we're managing a, a delicate balance, but I think, we're, I think we're growing at a pace that is exciting. The velocity is, has well, really continued. You know, the, as you probably know, there's this sort of underlying philosophy of, of, uh, of governance by contribution. <laughs> yes. As opposed to governance by belonging to a particular set of people that are self, then self-perpetuating. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important that we keep that underlying philosophy there, that if, if somebody, whether it be an individual or organization, is willing to really put the time and the effort into it, they can earn their way I into having uh, real influence uh, and meaningful influence uh, on the direction of the technology. I, th I think it's a real opportunity to uh, do something that, in, you know, uh, you know, down the line, people will say that you know, we're glad they did that. They, yeah. they, 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 did, they got it right. It's not the only open source project that you're involved in right now, though. Uh, you also had a, a hand in uh, Mifos, right, which is a open source. Uh, Kiva, effectively, open source microfinance to, to make people... Well, it's better. a little different from Kiva. Um, so just taking a step backwards, uh, I've come to really ap uh, appreciate um, open source because it, it is, amongst other things, the way that the industry has found to standardize. <laughs> you know, if you, if you go back long enough, uh, like I've been in the industry, you, you either had highly proprietary projects or you had standards committees, <laughs> and, and the, uh, you know there wasn't, a, uh, and we standards committees weren't that functional, which meant that the highly proprietary projects tended to win out. Yeah, standards committees aren't synonymous with high velocity. <laughs> exactly. Uh, whereas uh, you know, open source has proven to be a way whereby the industry can not only contribute but standardize going forward, and and it's done in a very constructive way. So you tend to get standards that actually work as a, in practice as opposed to only in theory. So with, with that in background, uh, one of the things I've been interested in uh, uh, is you know, how do we bring technology uh, to bear in, in, uh, in the developing world as the, well as the developed world. So uh, the, obs the MIFOS started as an effort to provide essentially open source automation software for uh, microfinance institutions. These are uh, sort of community banks, if you like, community lending as associations, uh, popularized uh, by people like the Grameen uh, organization in Bangladesh, uh, spread all around the world. So uh, about 12 years ago now, we started an effort to do that. Um, uh, and uh, like all good software, it's had to have been rewritten several times uh, along the way. The, the latest incarnation is, is actually proving to be very successful, and it's used by uh, uh, over 150 organizations around the wor world now. To me, the most interesting thing about it now is we're going to rewrite it again. <laughs> version 3.0. Uh, version 3.0 uh, to really make it a, in the sense that uh, I think there's been a lot of conversation around today uh, to be really a cloud native application, <laughs> and uh, I, I think this will be could be an interesting uh, opportunity with a lot of people have talked about it where uh, technology actually incubates fast in the developing world and then comes back into the developed world so what we 're really talking about now is open source banking software uh, and uh, so I think you 're going to see open source now go beyond traditional infrastructure where it's obviously taken roots into other areas that people would have never considered it before, but I, I think the, uh, the dynamic is there. That's pretty stunning, the idea of an open source bank running on open source banking software, and most, uh, most bankers in the United States would, would, would run screaming into the arms of the lawyers or from the regulators. <laughs> so the idea that helping the underbanked get banking services and using that also as a place to prove that this stuff can be reliable, safe, right. secure, and then maybe have a boomerang, boomerang effect where it can come back to developed countries and educate regulators. It's kind of a fascinating topic that open source well, can that, lead that, that way. That's one of the interesting possibilities here because uh, there's tremendous interest uh, in governments to give all of their citizens access to electronic money. And to have electronic money, you've got to have a bank account. The, the money has to go, go somewhere. Uh, so we're seeing uh, whole countries, uh, particularly in Latin America, uh, decide making a decision to uh, uh, try and have everybody in the country stop using cash <laughs> yeah. uh, because it's a way of improving uh, anti-corruption, tax collection, etc. So uh, countries like Ecuador are considering basically 
giving you a lower rate of sales tax if you use a debit card and making it uh, illegal for employers to pay their employees in cash. Yeah. Uh, but to do that, you've got to give everybody in the country now a bank account. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you need a much lower cost basis for doing that. Mm -hmm. So they are really getting behind this notion of modern cloud native open source banking software. The interesting thing, if, we, if it can be proved out in, those, uh, um, uh, those in that environment, is it could solve a dilemma that the first world countries have right now, which is they've got banks that are way inefficient, sitting on 40 and 50 year old software that's too inflexible. I've, I've had certain uh, banks tell me that they're actually seriously considering having to do a good, bad, bad bank, not for bad loans point of view, because of bad software point of view. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, but the regulators are scared stiff because they only want to move to a proven platform. So. It's kind of an interesting uh, journey we're going to be going on here. There's a whole stack of stuff that sticks there. And, you know, I, right I think place. if we can really show what modern cloud native software is, I know there's, there was discussion earlier by Justin Smith yes. about how to handle security from a different perspective. That's the kind of thing that if we can bring that into not only the infrastructure but now into the banking software, mm -hmm. that could further uh, uh, show how you can do a very high value activity on this kind of platform in a very different way. On open source, now, um, we're, we're now fairly advanced in open source. There's some statements being made recently about Hyperledger and others that open source is appropriate for things that are so important to society that they can't, we can't afford for them to be controlled by a single entity of any kind. But when you went to VMware, um, I took a job at Microsoft responsible for open source at Microsoft. And let me tell you, that was a hard job. <laughs> so you came out of a great successful career at Microsoft from one you know, very proprietary company into VMware, a very proprietary company. Then you hired in the team to build this, this amazing cloud, right? Cloud Foundry. And you decided to open source it. For me, looking back at, at, at your history in that moment, that's not an obvious decision. Was it obvious to you at the time? Or how did you get the religion? <laughs> Well, it, it, a number of things. First of all, by, you know, by 2006, 7, 8, uh, there were very successful open source projects out there, not to mention Linux, Linux not least of which is Linux. Uh, so it was clear that open source was a proven model. Secondly, enterprises were starting to realize that in some senses open source was the the safe choice, not the risky choice, because that's was the way that, as we said earlier, industry was starting to standardize and cooperate. So that was where the ecosystem was going to build. So businesses are starting to realize, hey, if they're not aligned with the ecosystem, uh, they could cut themselves off for the future. Uh, but also there was this perspective. If you look at a lot of the advances and waves of technology, there's usually at least one closed winner and one open winner. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, if you look uh, back in the in the PC days, you know, Microsoft was the closed winner. Uh, eventually, Linux caught up there uh, in in the uh, phone space. You've got iOS, you've got Android. That dynamic playing out. You can mm -hmm. have a debate about whether Android's truly open or not, but uh, <laughs> um, it makes Many the opinions. point. Yeah. You know, we, we know who the closed winner of the cloud is. <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> it doesn't take any IQ to figure that one out. The question is, is how and when will an open winner emerge? And, and e even in 2008-9, it was clear that that dynamic was going to play out. All right, so that combination of factors actually made it a very easy decision mm. to open source this uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think it'll be a great thing for the whole industry if we can show how you can have an open technology and good governance. If you look at uh, what you were saying earlier, talking about Bitcoin, for instance, there's an example of where the governance model was not thought through. No. And, and it's now actually paying the price for that. Yes. Uh, wonderful technology, tremendous innovation, uh, but nobody actually thought through, partly because they were anti-government. <laughs> it's, it's many hard. reasons. It's hard to. I used hard to think to, governance uh, was a four-letter word. I'm like, exactly. waste of time, bureaucracy. So that, a, there's a difference between government and governance. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, that's why when you go out on these endeavors, you've got to be thinking about this, not just from a technology point of view, mm -hmm. but from a governance point of view. And uh, for those of you who, who, who may not have, have really looked into it, I, I think there's a lot 
that Sam and very good work that Sam and others have done around Cloud Foundry to make sure that this ecosystem has good governance. Mm -hmm. We want to provide great economic opportunities, and one of the things that attracted me to uh, uh, to, to this challenge was was actually your original vision of a Linux for the cloud. But the the elaboration of that was how do we create a platform that's running in every data center in the world that's creating sort of a unified opportunity for packaged applications, for packaged services. How do we unlock well-behaved economic markets so we create the sustainable, global scale, open community and open ecosystem? So I think yep. that, that's an extraordinary idea. What, what do you think is missing? Where do you want to see us go? Like if you could help us kind of set our agenda for the, the hard problems we should be working on for the next few years to unlock that, because you've you built markets before. This is kind of the next time and maybe at an even bigger well, scale. Well, I mean, it, you, you made the, the key point. You, 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 at the end of the day, you've got to provide economic opportunity or economic value for a, a very large community of people. Uh, this can't be, you know, uh, where all the economic value can be siphoned up by one company. Uh, yeah, we need to build the, th the that anti that. That's the closed <laughs> that's already <model>. there. <laughs> Somebody's already doing that. We've yeah. got to do the other model. Yeah. The, uh, the, and uh, so I think uh, continuing to make sure that uh, we can have a, a very healthy ecosystem, meaningful competition, uh, almost at every level of the system, both at the subsystems, the system itself, the apps built on top of that. And then, of course, you, you've got to make this, uh, you, you've got to prime the pump. You've got to get to a certain level of functionality before others will be attracted uh, to, to, the, to the ecosystem. Uh, so I, I think continue to execute building out Cloud Foundry itself so it gets to a critical mass where customers are starting to drive real value of it. And I think that was one of the, the great things to see about this particular conference 2016 is we really saw uh, quite a wide variety of customers who are really now starting to get value out of the platform. Uh, and so if we can continue to execute well, fleshing the system out, making sure that the interfaces are open so many people can plug into it, and then above all, keeping it secure and easy to use because uh, without that you won't get the end customers if you're who at the end of the day are the real, uh, benef you know, the real intended beneficiaries of all of this using the system. Yeah, I was, uh, I was talking to Doug Safford earlier today. Um, they're doing amazing work at Allstate, adapting you know, the business and the digitization all around the platform. But where we are right now is they still have to write 100% of the code. Right? It's all bespoke, all brand new microservices. So that's kind of a stage of maturity for the platform. Uh, and we agreed that if we, if we can deliver on this vision of packaged software running on Cloud Foundry, they should be able to buy 90% of the packaged apps, microservices that they need, and that, just build 10% that are you, you just, you just got to make sure that you're consistently delivering that functionality down the road. I, you know, I can remember the day it makes some people shudder to hear this. I, I can remember, you know, going around begging people to write Windows applications. You know, <laughs> hard to imagine. You know, when you know when Microsoft had to supply all the apps themselves. You know, we had our stupid things like Paint, etc. But uh, which is still with us, believe it or not. The, uh, it's uh, actually a very good pixel editor. <laughs> it has actually. I've, not, it's actually I've become, used it a lot. I actually find myself using it now, which I never did in the past. But uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, the so I, you know, I, uh, that will come. Uh, if we, you could, you know, as uh, somebody said, you can r look incredibly strategic if you just have good execution. Yeah, absolutely right. Any um, any thoughts on how we should measure success going forward as, as we as we get into that ecosystem vision? No, I, I think uh, you know, none of this makes sense unless we have end customers using this. So yeah. you know, the 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 number of applications that are being deployed and used by end customers is obviously the primary metric uh, of, uh, of success. But then in addition to that, to your earlier point, it's the number of companies who are benefiting economically, whether by writing microservices, uh, providing uh, consulting services, all of that, that spectrum. Uh, but, but it's a feedback effect between those two. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to focus on building that economy. Um, I think... Uh, we, we come at this with so much respect for you and what you've built. And despite the fact that you're not the executive chairman of the foundation, but the executive chairman of, of Pivotal, um, Dr. Nick, I think, was, was right calling you the grandfather of Cloud Foundry. Uh, I didn't want to offend. Uh, so, well, I, I, uh, so it turns out that you're actually a grandfather. Exactly. They are. In the real yeah. world. So what I wanted to do uh, and what the, what the team decided to do was to, to offer you 
we'd like to invite you to uh, recognize your status. Well, this is a whole lot better than the T-shirt I got last time. <laughs> the Cloud Foundry jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so please give it up for Paul Moritz. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sam. Thank you so much. I really appreciate right. it. Thank you Thank for getting away Thanks. from us. Cheers. <laughs>